Right. Hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Shuvo. And uh, can I just check before we start that you can hear me and that you can see me okay? Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's lovely. Excellent. So uh, I am director of the Google Digital Academy and um, Squared Online is really our flagship program. So I'm really pleased to be here for this webinar. And today we are going to be talking, as the title says, about digital marketing transformation. Uh, specifically, we're going to be spending this session talking about the digital skills gap. And as it says here, about how do you build a business's digital capability through practical application, and how leading companies are driving a digital mindset and change. Specifically, I'll be talking about a piece of research which was done on this last year. And also, we'll be introducing uh, Kate Hamer after me, who will be providing some perspective as to how this happens on the ground in real organisations as well. Uh, one more thing before diving into this is um, the, on the left hand side, you'll see there's the general discussion box and we'll be switching between both general discussion and uh, moderated discussion. Uh, so please be aware that in some cases we'll be asking for you to put in some questions or your thoughts um, and it'll be very public. And in some cases, even when it's not, you can still put in questions uh, for us to dwell on later. I hope that's OK. OK, give me a virtual thumbs up if that's all makes sense and you're happy to me to get going. Very good. Fantastic. So, uh, as I said, I'm going to kick off with a piece around some research called the Talent Revolution, which is a program that was all about driving digital skills across the marketing industry. And to introduce that, I've got a short video that we're going to play, uh, which includes me and also some other folk that we were working with across last year and this year, which will tell you the story. And then we'll kick off from there. Uh, Callum, could you play the video for us? There's lots being said at the moment about the digital skills gap, especially in the marketing and advertising industry. I think we all recognise that there's lots more that could be done to address that. But the question is, what are these skills? So the Google Digital Academy has got together with BCG, the Knowledge Engineers, ISBAR, the IPA, the IAB, the Marketing Academy and the Marketing Society to create the Talent Revolution. So the Talent Revolution is all about really unearthing the skill gaps in the marketing industry. Together, we want to help companies with a simple health check on their digital know-how. So there's a digital skills gap in the UK right now. Who knew that? A show of hands, please. A couple of you. Great. I'm delighted that it's hit your agenda. I think our aspirations as a team are to enable the industry to become best in class when it relates to digital skills. The group's trying to create a definitive benchmark for digital skills so that companies and individuals can assess where they are in relation to other people and in relation to be able to achieve their business objectives. A huge one is sort of lack of funding. I think initially there is a lack of, of budget going into the digital skills gap. It's been recognised, yet, um, you know, I think L&D directors really need to, you know, go to their boards and request more funding and it's going to become incredibly important that it's not just going to happen out of nowhere. So the Talent Revolution survey is being designed with the industry for the industry and with input from a whole range of companies across the UK and Germany. We're really excited at Unilever about this Talent Revolution survey. We've been looking at ways that we could um, benchmark our marketeers against others in the industry and we think this is a really exciting opportunity and a new solution for everyone. I'm really looking forward to seeing how the digital marketing industry in the UK is performing and how we're performing within it. I think this is a great study that the industry really needs to get behind. I think anything that improves the understanding of where we are in the digital world is very, very important. The Talent Revolution Survey really is the first opportunity we've had as a community to understand exactly how we measure up against each other so that can only be a good thing for, for colleagues in marketing. Taking part in the Talent Revolution survey couldn't be easier. All you need to do is share the survey link with your marketing teams. It should take no more than 15 minutes for anyone to complete. And the more data you get, obviously the more accurate your results will be. What's more, 
If you have more than eight of your marketeers participate in the survey, then you'll get a free benchmarking report that will compare your company to peers in your industry against different dimensions of digital capability. If you think about the industry in general, the idea that at the moment people don't know where they sit is really, it's crazy. So having some kind of unified approach and a collective um, joined up way of thinking about skills is so brilliant. So get involved and help us to help you to help your business get ahead in digital. Well, in my view, the Talent Revolution Survey is the thing that the industry has been waiting for. Okay, and we're back. Um, once again, can you see and hear me okay again? Fantastic. Right, so the talent revolution, hopefully that video told uh, a short story about what we were trying to do. That was almost a year ago now. And since then, we actually had uh, 65 companies across the UK and Germany participate in this survey. Um, some of the largest companies around, the likes of Procter & Gamble, Unilever, Vodafone, uh, the UK government, uh, John Lewis, Barclays, many others, all participated in this survey. In total, almost 1,200 marketeers were surveyed. Um, each of those companies received their own benchmark reports, and there was one major industry report that aggregated the results of everything that we learnt across 2015. So in this session, I wanted to share a little bit about what we learnt uh, from this survey and what are the implications for marketeers going forward and what are the implications for how we do build digital capabilities. Now, the big question is, how did the industry score overall? And I guess I'd like you to have a bit of a guess at this for me. Um, if you would imagine that um, a zero score for digital capabilities is a company that has barely considered the internet, uh, has not really used any form of digital marketing whatsoever. And a hundred is a company that uses every single digital best practice that you know one could think of today, and that really digital has become an intrinsic part of who they are, how they operate. If you were to cut that organisation open, you know they would be digital through and through. So that's a very blunt way of looking at it. But if uh, on a score of zero to one hundred, I'd like you to vote for me as to what do you think the overall score for the entire marketing industry, at least those that we surveyed, was. Uh, you have a choice of forty-eight, fifty-seven, or seventy-one. Let's just see what your guesses would be. So let's have a look. I'd say heavily towards the 48s and the, a few optimists on the 71, I see. Okay, but mostly 48s and 57s so far, I would say, on the lower end. Broadly, you'd be right. So the answer is 57. Um, but what does that really mean? Uh, 57, is that a good number? Is that a bad number? Um, well, actually, there was a big spread, and here is a distribution of the scores that uh, we received. And as you can see, um, you know, 57 was an average, about 14 of the companies were about there. And as you might expect, there was a distribution from low to high, and, uh, you know, there's fewer at the bottom end and fewer at the top end. But I guess the point is that even the very highest was up at 70, 75. So in other words, regardless of who you're looking at, there's still a significant gap to 100. Um, the next question you might ask yourself is, uh, how should we feel about that? Are these good numbers? Are these bad numbers? What do those numbers actually mean? And, you know, should we do something about them? To understand the answer to that, uh, it's really important to know what was asked in this questionnaire and what are these best practices that we were benchmarking. So what we identified together with BCG were these nine key areas. Uh, it was about how companies plan, how they act and how they measure. In fact, 
this particular framework was built with the input of over 30 different companies. So Google working together with BCG and lots of the companies that I mentioned earlier, plus a whole range of uh, advertising, media and creative agencies, all input to what they believed their people should learn about. And these are the nine areas that really came out. So the plan piece is around overall marketing and brand strategy and how that's done. Partner management was to do with agency management because this was primarily focused on the needs of client marketeers. And critical enablers included things like um, senior leadership behaviors, investment in technology, and investment in L&D and development programs for their people. The ACT piece is really about what happens in the way that they run their actual campaigns and their digital activity. The channels, so the media that they use, the way that they develop content through that media and the way that they develop their targeting techniques and uh, ideally get the right message to the right person at the right time. And the final piece around measurements, uh, fairly self-explanatory as you can see here, metrics and measurement, analytics, testing and learning. So those are the nine big areas. And just to bring a little bit more um, detail to this. So within these areas, for instance, within some of the channels, we might have asked about mobile and a typical sentiment or a particular best practice might have been something more basic, such as, quotes, our mobile website experience is optimized for how consumers use it. So that would have been a best practice statement that would have been in the mobile section of the channels category. Um, and at the other end, you know, a more advanced example might be uh, still on mobile. We use data to effectively attribute the value of mobile and determine the right spend levels. So you can see that across all of these different areas, we asked quite specific statements, some of which were more basic, some of which were more advanced. So when you think about it in that context, you know, a 57 is possibly what you would expect. Not all companies are right up at that advanced end, and I wouldn't expect that every company would tick all of the advanced boxes. So just to keep moving then, um, let's just see what else we can learn from the numbers of the survey. Here's another quick poll for you. Which of these do you think would have been the lowest? Would it have been A, our mobile strategy is based on understanding mobile's role in the consumer journey? Or B, uh, we fully understand the role social media plays in our consumer journey? Or C, we fully understand the role of video in our consumer journey? What would you guess companies scored themselves the lowest on? Remembering that this is their own self-assessment and this is 1,200 marketeers who answered that question. Let's have a look. A, C's, B, lots of C's so far, a few A's. I would say, hard to know what the exact number is here, but I think, I think you're verging towards a C as a group. Um, quite a few Bs. So it might surprise you to learn then that actually um, it was the mobile one that was by far the lowest. Only 19% of those 1200 marketeers agreed that their mobile strategy is based on understanding mobile's role in the consumer journey. Um, we had a sense actually before we started doing this survey that mobile might still be a challenge for lots of marketeers. We didn't realize quite how much of a challenge it was going to be. And in fact, there was a whole range of different statements related to mobile that we were quite surprised at, frankly, how bad companies still are at grappling with the challenge of the new mobile revolution. Even though I guess, you know, the first iPhone was launched back in 2007. So, you know, we're now, what, eight, nine years into the smartphone revolution. And still, it seems that, you know, even more than social, even more than video, mobile continues to be a challenge for a lot of uh, major organizations. Um, and interestingly, one other stat which really reinforces this point is that only 11% of companies, so even less, only 11% agreed that their organization was using data to effectively attribute the value of mobile. Um, now, if you think about your own behaviours for a second, most of us now are using interchangeably mobile devices, tablets, desktops, even smart TVs and so on. So multiple screens. And in many cases, if you think about um, 
something that you're doing with commercial intent. You, perhaps you're trying to research something, buy something online. More often than not, in fact, about 90% of occasions, uh, you'll often start on one device, but you'll finish that journey and make that final purchase on another device or on another browser or in an app. So, you know, there isn't a one-to-one -one connection from the device in the browser that you started with and the device in the browser that you finished with. So actually attributing value to the different steps along the journey that you might have taken, because you probably, from the day that you started looking, and it might have been, uh, you know, purchasing a holiday, or it might have been a mortgage, or it might have been you end up buying something from Amazon, but whatever it might be, quite often this is happening across different devices. Um, and it becomes really hard from a marketing point of view to know, well, which interaction had the greatest impact? Where did mobile fit in that customer journey? And how am I supposed to attribute value to that mobile interaction? So I know how much I should invest behind that. A huge challenge for the industry right now. It remains one, and only 11% of, um, of organizations say that they're starting to use the data to effectively attribute that value. So that's a great example of one of the biggest challenges that the industry is facing today. Um, now, there are some other questions in the survey as well, some broader organizational enablers, things like leadership. So here's some example statements. Our senior leaders empower us to challenge established models. There were questions about structure, asking people, do you think your marketing structure enables you to deliver well-coordinated cross-channel communications? And also about the learning that happens in organizations, such as, do you have a learning program which enables you to build digital knowledge and skills required for my role? So these are broader organizational enablers that all help to drive digital capability in one form or another. So here's my next uh, pop quiz. So this one's a higher or lower one. Um, we've got three statements here. Um, and let me ask you to give me a uh, estimate for the first statement. So give me a percentage. How many people do you think said or agreed that our senior leaders emphasize the importance of evolving marketing for a digital world? Give me a guess at a percentage. 20%, 60%, 20%, 65 78%. Oh, quite polarized here. Some of you are quite pessimistic, some of you are quite optimistic. Right, a big spread. Okay, right, so, well, I'll give you the answer on this one. In fact, 60% of the companies that we spoke to said that their senior leaders emphasized the importance of evolving marketing for the digital world. So, quite a lot of leaders are talking a good talk. Um, Although, having said that, 40% are still not, which, you know, you might consider actually shocking given how far we are in today's digital world and how much marketing has changed recently. So, next one. Um, give me just a higher or lower. So, versus 60%, higher or lower said our senior leaders empower us to challenge established models. Lower, 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 lower. Exactly. Well predicted, everybody. So only 44% said that their senior leaders empowered them to establish, to challenge the established models. And once again, give me one more higher or lower on the last statement here. Versus the 44, higher or lower said, our senior leaders have provided resources or investment or shelter for marketing innovations. Lower again, lower, 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 lower. Exactly. So once again, well predicted everyone. Only 29% of senior leaders um, or companies said that their senior leaders were actually providing that investment and shelter. So this tells a really interesting story about what's going on in companies today. Um, there is lots of folk who are talking um, a good talk. Um, however, how does that translate to action? Is that translating to challenging as models, actually providing the resources or shelter for marketing innovations? you know, providing um, a culture in which uh, companies and individuals can take risks and try new things. You know, clearly, that's still a challenge for most of the marketing industry, and it's one which we're all facing today. Um, often, larger organizations are struggling with this even more than the smaller ones, interestingly. Now, one last point as well that I wanted to raise um, is about the nature of marketing these days. Um, I'm sure you all recognize here the very famous Don Draper. And um, here we have an example of a, uh, of a culture of marketing that was built back in the day. And in those days of Mad Men, it was all about the smart line. It was all about the cute creative. 
Um, it was all about saying the right thing. And clearly marketing has evolved a lot more since the days of Mad Men. And in fact, our own uh, general manager, Eileen Norton, um, re recently gave a speech about the, the evolution from Mad Men to Math Men. And uh, it was really about the move through to a much more analytic version of marketing. So given that analytics is becoming increasingly important in the world today, um, it was again a little depressing to see that 72% of marketers were unsure that they had the right mix of analytical capabilities and marketing experience to turn data into actionable insights. That remains a major challenge. Um, and in the, in the context of everything that we've said, uh, the mobile challenge, the senior leadership challenge, uh, the challenge around uh, marketing capabilities and analytics, 80% of companies said that they did not find the current investment in marketing capabilities sufficient. So, you know, this is a real challenge for the entire industry at the moment. And only 13% believe that their digital marketing L&D programs are effective. So in terms of what's being done about these challenges, it's still not enough, frankly. So um, to kind of conclude this story, I just wanted to show you what companies have now seen. Um, all these questions were actually laddered up to something that we called the DCI, or Digital Capability Index. That's something which BCG helped us to create. And it measured, it, it was a combination of how many people in a company agreed to a statement and also how much they agreed. So if you took a sample of marketeers from a large company like P&G or Unilever, if all of them had all agreed strongly to all of the statements, then that would have been a score of 100. Um, and for every every individual statement would have had a digital capability index. So every one of the statements that you've seen so far in this presentation has its own DCI, which is a combination of how many people agreed to it and how much they agreed to that statement. Um, so 100 would be everybody agreed to, uh, to that statement. Uh, what that allowed us to do is to, uh, to look at the, the scores on two dimensions. So you've got performance, which was your DCI, and then you've also got importance, which is how important was that capability to your industry? And the combination of DCI plus performance and importance allowed us to draw a chart a bit like this. Um, so this is um, a large company. I believe it was, I can't tell you which one, but it was, a, I believe, a large um, consumer goods company. And uh, this showed um, a measure of where their particular capabilities were. So all the different things that we were talking today, you saw that sort of nine box grid earlier, plotted out. So some capabilities, this company is ahead of its peers relative to the average for their industry and some behind. So on the horizontal axis, you can see whether they're ahead or behind on that capability compared to similar companies in their industry. And on the vertical axis, you can see peer importance. So that's about how, how important their peers in the industry believed that capability is for their business. So for instance, in this case, the industry believes that strategy and planning was particularly important, whereas display media less important. And this company happens to be quite strong on marketing analytics, but relative to their peers, quite weak on partner and agency management. So we hope that uh, by providing this kind of insight, which was really not available until there was a real benchmark in the industry, that helps to inform where companies should spend their time. So if you want to see all the results, uh, you can see the final results in the Talent Revolution survey from 2015, so BCG's final report, and there's a link here if you want to go there. Um, and just to say what happens this year is in 2016, the plan is to basically make this much, much bigger. This year we'll be covering more companies, so not just for large companies, but we'll be using a similar approach uh, for agencies and also for small companies as well. So we'll go all the way from small to medium enterprise up to very large companies and more countries. So we're taking this out beyond the UK and Germany to many more markets around the world. Um, and this is really part of our commitment to help build digital skills. And some of you may have seen in the press recently that Google has announced uh, that having previously had a target of a million individuals trained in digital skills with, by 2016, actually we've already hit that target through a whole range of different programs, including, by the way, Squared and Squared Online, um, 
my other digital academy programs and programs like the Digital Garage in the UK, Activate in Spain. So across EMEA, uh, we're, we're aiming to help upskill millions of individuals across digital skills because it's so important to businesses and the economy overall. And if you want to know about all of this and then some more, um, here's some websites that you can go to, digitalacademy.com, wearesquare.com, digitalgarage uh, with google.com. We're really committed to helping to drive all of this um, across many, many markets. Um, and we hope that both the learnings that we have from the Talent Revolution Survey combined with the efforts that we're putting into training can help drive digital skills more broadly. So uh, that's it for now. Um, I would like to uh, switch over to uh, Kate now. Um, who is going to talk a little bit about how this um, how this works in real companies? Hi, everyone. Can everyone see and hear me? Okay. Apologies that we are overrunning slightly, but I will give you a whistle-stop tour of uh, what I'm going to be speaking about, and then there'll be some time for questions as well. Uh, so I'm Kate Hamer. I worked uh, in many different large brands in digital for over a decade, and now I am an independent consultant, so I work a lot on digital transformation projects with my clients. Um, and I'm just going to share with you some of the learnings um, and kind of insights that I've got from working both in these organizations and with them. So the key for me really is to make sure that you've got the right mindset when it comes to digital. So, you know, as Shuvo was just showing, it's known at senior leadership level how important it is to um, use digital tools and start to work in a digital way, but it really needs to go right throughout the organization um, and people really need to understand the value of digital both in marketing and in other areas of the business. Um, I think for me, if you are a consumer centric business and you're really starting with what the consumer wants or needs, then you can't actually go far wrong. Um, obviously, you want to inspire and enthuse people around the business to um, let them see the benefit of using different digital channels and how they can really improve their marketing campaigns as a result. I think sometimes um, businesses have to kind of allocate an arbitrary amount of spend, for example, on digital media to try and push the agenda and um, make people really focus on that. But eventually you want to get to a point where you've got truly agnostic planning, where you're looking at who is my consumer, where are they, and then investing in the right channels, be they online or offline, to communicate with people. I think the other important thing is to not uh, be siloed in the approach. So again, at times when businesses really need focus on something, they'll tend to create a separate team. So a lot of businesses have their separate digital team. And you're always going to need that from the kind of infrastructure and expertise level. Uh, you want someone who absolutely understands how to build websites, what content management systems to use, how to optimize them for search, etc. But in terms of the actual digital marketing, then that needs to be your marketeers because if they're doing campaigns and then sort of handing off and letting the digital team focus on the digital bits, then they're eventually going to become extinct anyway because this is just life now, this is how we work. So for example, the sort of thing that you might consider is you would have a real expert social strategist and they are your gatekeeper of your social channels. They are immersed in the analytics. Uh, they know all about the content plan, but they're the gatekeepers. They're like an internal consultant working with your marketing team so that when marketers are coming up with campaign ideas, they can be advising and saying, well, that piece of content would work really well on this day, or this is the best way to get that message across, or this is the right platform to use, etc. cetera. Um, and then the, the other thing, as I said, is it really needs to go through the whole business. Um, I think one of the stats in the Talent Revolution survey was that only 20% of marketers agreed that support functions like finance, like IT and legal, were able to support them in digital and you know it's all well and good upskilling marketers on all the great channels that you can use but 
if they're then coming back into the business and wanting to do retargeting of people that have been on their website and legal aren't um, knowledgeable about cookie policies and what that means for your terms and conditions, then it's not going to um, work so well. So the other interesting thing I think is that digital almost brings marketing out of the shadows. So marketing has always been about a consumer insight and then broadcasting a message about how your product meets that need or that desire. Um, but now marketing are almost in conversation with the consumer. So where in the past it's very much been broadcast just a message on TV or a message on a billboard, now it's a two-way conversation in places like social media, um, even within search to a certain extent, you know, you're responding to much more um, tailored and specific requests that people are putting in in search and you need to be able to talk more um, about your brand. And again, I think that's where older, more established companies, the guidelines and brand guidelines and stuff that you have don't necessarily help with that. Only 35% of marketers in the survey agreed that they had created a consistent social media voice for the brand across platforms. So again, that's something to consider about how can you start to engage more with your consumers. And I think that's why um, video and display don't quite work because you've got assets that really were made for above the line. You know, you take your TV ad, if you try to just use that in video and digital or mobile, it just doesn't work as well as if you really create something that's fit for purpose. Um, again, only 21% of people agreed that they tailored stuff to relevant devices and um, for relevant consumers. I think one great example of this actually is, I don't know if anybody saw the World Cup of Chocolate that Richard Osman from Pointless started um, just after New Year. Did anybody vote in that? It was on Twitter. Uh, yeah, someone. Um, so that, as soon as being a geek, as soon as I see that sort of stuff, I straight away look at all the chocolate brands' Twitter pages to think, what are they doing? How are they getting involved? And none of them were online. None of them were participating in it in any way. The only brand that got involved was Betfair, and they actually ran a real book on it, and you could have a bet on who was going to win the World Cup of Chocolate. But that was a real missed opportunity because it wouldn't have been sort of elbowing your way into a conversation where you weren't invited chocolate brands were actually being tweeted by their consumers saying i hope people vote for dairy milk or whatever it might have been and that could have been a really nice way to get involved um if any of you work for crisp brands um he's going to do the crisp world cup at easter so uh, betfair have already opened some pre-betting i think frazzles are currently favorites to win that um, but yeah, check it out because those kind of things I think are where marketing can really do some fun, creative stuff and get involved. And then the final point that I wanted to talk about is talent. So obviously it's really important to build um, digital capability within the business. And one great way of doing this is to recruit external digital talent. And again, as I was saying earlier, I would always go for talent in specialisms. So your social strategists, your data scientists, you know, you saw the figures from Shuvo, people are not confident in terms of how they use the data that's coming from marketing and um, digital. And they're the kind of real specialisms that you want to get in. But in terms of the marketing, you want to be able to upskill your whole marketing workforce for that. I think in terms of how you can um, recruit digital talent, particularly in companies that aren't necessarily well known for digital, it can be hard to attract great talent because there's so few of them compared to the amount of positions that are being created. People can be quite choosy about where they go to work. And what I've found working in businesses is that you really need a special kind of person to come in and be a digital expert within an FMCG, for example, because not only do you want them to be brilliant at digital, but you want them to be a real change agent. You want them to have influence and want to come in and rattle some cages and look at how they can really develop the business. Um, you know, some people just want to go in and do their job and go home at the end of the day and perhaps at a pure player, you know, they're not even in a digital team, they're just doing their job. Um, so it, it does take a specific um, kind of character. I think the other thing is, um, in terms of retention of digital talent, they're not all necessarily going to want to become generalists in the end. They will, some of them want to stay specialised. And so if you think about um, 
the kind of traditional route of career progression, especially in FMCG, where you might go from a sort of assistant product manager through to a marketing director or a general manager, they're not going to fit within that model. And actually, that's okay. It's okay to churn digital talent every few years because they get what they needed in terms of experience, you get what you needed, and then you get a fresh pair of eyes and someone new in again. The third thing in terms of digital talent is just because people are great at digital doesn't mean they're great at teaching digital. And I think sometimes companies can think that those people are also going to be the ones that will be able to train the wider business. And actually, you need a real solid L&D program to upskill everybody internally. And also, you want some training that's actually going to keep pushing those digital experts further and not just let them stagnate and kind of use what they knew when they came in the business and not necessarily develop it. Just one other note in terms of talent is obviously to use your agencies as well. Um, they can be a great way of either filling some of the skill gaps that you've potentially got in your business or helping you to upskill your business. Some of the larger creative and media agencies are sometimes in the same boat in terms of their own digital transformation and are perhaps not um, at the cutting edge of some of the different types of um, digital media that they could be working on. I think in the survey, 29% of people agreed that their media agency was at the cutting edge of digital marketing and 21% in terms of creative agencies. So they've also got transformation to do. But there are opportunities to work with smaller agencies, perhaps real specialists within video or within display media um, who can help you kind of kick your business on. Um, obviously, that leads to potential portfolios of agencies that you might be managing and that in itself brings whole new requirements in terms of the way that the the client and your business are really clear on what your objectives are who is responsible for what where everybody's remit starts and ends um, but that can work really well to have a, a network of agencies that you can use so that is my whistle stop tour um, we're now going to take some questions I'm going to hand back to uh, Shubo for this, but I will be typing in the box. If there's any specific questions for me, I will answer them. Um, and thank you. Hi again. Uh, just checking once again, you can see and hear me. Fantastic. Um, so yes, uh, once again, sorry we're running a little bit behind, but for those of you who have stuck with us, we'd obviously love to take some questions and, um, uh, and answer some. So uh, yes, we've had some questions coming in, which is excellent. Um, one question, first of all, um, how should large organizations innovate digitally internally to make them better at marketing and communication? I understand what we need to do to help consumers, but not what should be done and should be seeing happening internally. Um, so I, I could interpret that question in two ways. And here's just a thought, really. Um, so first of all, there is the innovation about ways of working to enable better external marketing communications. And then there's also the way in which you can innovate to use digital technology internally. Um, on the first piece, how do you innovate in your ways of working? I think one of the biggest things that we've seen is the shift from very hierarchical structures to ones which are much more networked. Um, in the digital space, we see that um, campaigns need all manner of different skills, which come from different places uh, within an organization and with their agencies as well. And one of the biggest challenges is just assembling the right team assembling a group of people who happen to have the right skills and have them work together very fast. So um, the ability to just um, create a network of individuals is uh, has become paramount. And actually, the ability to lead on that has become uh, a, a real challenge. So actually, interestingly, leadership skills have become uh, increasingly necessary, strong leadership skills to be able to bring disparate groups of people together very fast. The second part of that question around sort of digital use inside an organization. Um, I think that there is uh, definitely plenty of plenty more potential to use digital technology inside. I mean, I've, I've been at Google for nine years now, and I still remember coming 
here and seeing how seamlessly we use things like, like I mean, the technologies we're using right now, for instance. Um, so the ability to have webinars, live chat um, at Google, we use obviously as no surprise Google Hangouts a lot um, to connect people across the world. It's quite quite seamless. And actually that kind of thing, collaborative documents, um, actually speed up, the, they kind of oil the wheels of collaboration within organizations um, very quickly. And I don't think that you know enough of that is really widespread across lots of large companies yet. Okay, some more questions. Um, so this must start with leadership teams. This is a question from David Hicks. This must start with leadership teams. How would you start engaging them? Uh, again, that is that's a big question. I think that it sort of depends on function um, initially. Uh, we're definitely seeing that senior senior leadership teams in the marketing function um, are genuinely on this and they are genuinely caring about it. You saw the stats about you know senior leaders talking a good talk. Um, that's definitely happening in marketing. It doesn't always translate to action yet. Um, however, it is you know they are engaged. Uh, there's very few senior marketing leaders who are not at least engaged. Um, I think that coming back to what Kate said, there is a challenge with other functions at the moment that are perhaps less immediately affected by the digital revolution. Um, if you're in, uh, you know, finance or HR or whatever, there's a lot of legal. There's lots and lots of other parts of the organisation that interface with marketing that perhaps have not yet seen how they are connected in as well. Um, we we've been trying actually to bring organizations together, sort of the C-suite from large organizations to meet together and have some of that conversation. Um, but more often than not, I think that learning at a really senior level needs to become a, um, an imperative. And if there's anything that we learned from the, uh, the talent revolution, it's that there's still a gap, there's still a gap at a senior level and that um, right at the top of organizations those that are already starting to walk, talk the talk need to start walking the walk and with their senior leadership okay and then one more question this is probably the last one um, that we'll take in the time we have this is from chris neat how do we take part in the survey and is there some documentation you can send through that details what's involved in the training and the costs associated um, so actually, very shortly, um, we will be announcing uh, a pre-registration site, uh, which is open to all. It'll be open access. Uh, you can go along. You'll be able to register your name and the company that you'd like to uh, have take the survey. And then a few weeks after that, um, the survey itself will launch. So we'll let the um, um, we'll, we'll definitely publish that through the Squared Network so that that is um, well known throughout the network. So hopefully the, the route that you found out about through this webinar, you'll, you'll see the same information there as well. And in terms of the costs, I'm very pleased to say that uh, the survey is free for everyone to take and it's really there as a service to help any organisation to build its digital capability. So um, that's it for today. Thank you for those of you who've been listening in um, and stuck it through through the whole piece and listening to the questions as well. Um, and do please get in touch. Here's the contact details as ever on the final slide. Thank you again for listening today and hope it was useful. All right, thanks for everybody and goodbye from me.